It's now time for questions to the Office of the First Minister and Deputy First Minister. And firstly, we have topical questions, and I call Dominic Bradley. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I would last, uh, like to ask the Deputy First Minister, is he personally committed to the bridge at Norra Water? Thank you. Yeah, the short answer to that is yes. I'm absolutely committed to the construction of the new bridge at Norra Water. And I do so on the basis of the tremendous success that a very small bridge in my own city has made to the life of that city. Something like £17 million pounds sterling was spent on it and it has had a massive impact on the city and effectively represents a new iconic image for the city. Likewise, I think that the construction of a bridge at Norra Water uh, would have uh, a similar effect for the people of North Louth and South Down and add immensely to the uh, tourist potential in that uh, area. We in this House all understand the difficulties in terms of the tendering process and the scale of the tender that was way in excess of what was expected. And since that, there have been, I think, a number of discussions around whether or not a remedy could be put in place. Uh, myself and Katrina Rian uh, were involved in discussions in Ross Trevor uh, with the Taoiseach. Uh, I have also been involved in other discussions uh, with uh, very senior advisors to the Taoiseach. And I know that in the backdrop there is uh, a sense of some remedy for the difficulties that exist. So I think it's absolutely important in the context of the next very short while that we establish whether or not uh, enough funding can be put in place to ensure that this bridge is constructed. So I think what, what I would like to see as the next important step in this process is uh, uh, a commitment from uh, the government in Dublin uh, in conjunction with other aspects flowing from the councils on both sides of the uh, divide as to whether or not this is a scheme that is going to go ahead. I certainly would like to see it go ahead and I'm very much committed to it. I call Dominic Bradley for a supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker, and thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Indeed, I, I was in Derry recently and I walked over the, the Peace Bridge to uh, Abrington and uh, saw the, the Turner Prize there. I must say I was more impressed by the bridge than I was by some of the uh, exhibits. Would the member come to this Turner question, exhibition. please? But uh, having said that, Mr. Deputy Speaker, um, would, would the Deputy First Minister recommend to the Finance Minister to provide uh, the funding which would fill the existing gap in the Nora Water uh, project? Thank you. Well, f first of all, I, if I could say that uh, I too visited the, the Turner Prize and was very impressed. And uh, I know that something in the region of over a thousand people each day have visited. So there's a tremendous interest in it, and I would encourage everybody to uh, go to the city for the purposes of uh, seeing the Turner Prize for the first time ever outside of England. I think that uh, in the context of the second part of the uh, commentary that was made, I think it would be wrong to identify our finance minister as the problem in regard to uh, narrow water. Uh, there, there is uh, effectively a responsibility on the Irish government, on ourselves, on the SEUPB and on the councils on both sides of the narrow water to come up with a solution. I don't know if that solution uh, can be found. Uh, I would like to hear the Irish government say more about it. Uh, in my discussions with the Taoiseach and Ross Trevor now, quite a number of weeks ago, it was indicated to me that he did intend to say something about it, but thus far there has been silence. So I uh, would hope that in the course of the next short while we will hear 
as to whether or not a solution can be found to the problems presented by uh, a tender which was wi widely beyond the expectations of all of us. The member at question number two has withdrawn his name. I call Ian McRae. Thank you, Deputy Speaker. Um, can the Deputy First Minister update the House on the progress that's been made um, on the Community Safety College for Desert Creek? Well, I think the member is a colleague of mine in the constituency knows that this is a project that I'm very keen to see brought to fruition. Uh, there, of course, have been difficulties also with that particular project, something in the same realm of the discussions that we've just had over the Nora Water Bridge tender. I know that uh, refinements and amendments have been made, and I have a very full and clear expectation that the Community Safety College uh, in Cookstown uh, will go ahead, and I fully and absolutely support that. I call Ian McRae for supplementary. Um, the Deputy First Minister will know that um, the local economy is um, in need of this important college to, to take place. Can the Deputy First Minister um, you know, give any detail as to when any announcements will um, take place in respect of the um, proposed start dates and can he give an assurance that um, the, the work will take place will be done as quickly as possible to ensure there's no further delay? I absolutely agree with the member in terms of the contribution that the construction of such a community safety college will have for the uh, citizens in Cookstown. Uh, no doubt bringing uh, much needed uh, economic benefit to the area. The discussions that have taken place uh, thus far uh, have progressed the project. Uh, I believe that uh, we're very close to seeing uh, the project commence. And I do believe that uh, we can have uh, reasonable expectations that the problems that have been uh, afflicting the project over the course of the last uh, number of months uh, will be resolved and the work will begin as soon as possible, hopefully uh, around the beginning of next year. <coughs> the member at uh, question four has withdrawn their name also, so I call Ms Brenda Hale. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. And I I'd like to ask the Deputy First Minister, he will be well aware of those whose loved ones are known as the disappeared. What particular help can he offer, given his Republican background, to enable and ensure that those bodies are returned for family burial? Well, my full sympathy uh, and compassion is with all of those families. They are by far and away the most important people in the course of this discussion. I believe that uh, what happened to these families was totally and absolutely wrong. I believe it was cruel. I believe it was unjustified. And of course the IRA were responsible. I and all our Sinn Féin leaders, all our Republican leaders, have over the course of uh, a number of years been involved in exhorting anyone with any scrap of information whatsoever about the location of these bodies to bring them forward. And that has brought uh, considerable success for some families, but sadly not for others. And I would again reiterate my appeal to anyone out there in the community who in any way were involved in any of these situations to bring forward that information, to bring it forward to the Commission, to bring it forward to anybody in a responsible position within society, and, and to bring it forward to uh, Republican leaders who I think are very anxious to see uh, this situation resolved. So my full compassion and support is with the families. It's been a terrible ordeal. It's been a despicable ordeal. And I believe there is a huge responsibility on everybody, including myself as a Republican leader, to appeal to anybody out there who can assist these families out of the nightmare that they face on a daily basis. I call Brenda Hale for supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer, and given his answer, how can he then explain the conflicting reports emanating from the public and movement about why these murders were committed and by whom? Well, I mean, I, I think that, that's another matter altogether, uh, which uh, undoubtedly people will have their own particular opinions about. 
The families at this stage that I have listened to appear to be more concerned to have the recovery of their loved ones. And I think that's where the big focus is at this moment in time. I think there is a huge responsibility on all of us to support those families, to support them uh, to, to a resolution, uh, the resolution that they seek, which is the return of their loved ones. As I've said, there has been considerable success, but there are a number of families out there who are still suffering. And when I listen to the interviews that they've given, including some in, in the course of the last uh, couple of hours, their big focus is on the recovery of the bodies as opposed to anything else. I call on Mervyn's story. Uh, thank you, Mr. I was following on really from the, the question of my colleague, Brenda Hale. Given all the public concern that there has been expressed over the last number of weeks and months, both in regards to the disappeared and also the activities of the President of his party, what action has he taken to ensure that all available information is made available to the courts, to the police service of Northern Ireland, and that any scrap of information as he refers to in relation to the allegations in regards to Gerry Adams and in regards to uh, the uh, terrible death of Jean McConville and the other disappeared is brought to the courts? Well, I think that uh, the issue around uh, the terrible circumstances of uh, child abuse have been well articulated and well aired in the course of recent times. And Gerry Adams has made uh, public uh, his position in relation to the role that he played, given that this was first reported to both the social services and to the RUC in 1987. And I do believe there is a huge responsibility on everybody within society, without exception, that whatever information they have in regard to uh, situations of uh, child abuse has to be brought forward uh, to the proper authorities. And uh, over the course of, I think, many years now, many organisations, I think, have learned a lot from what have been quite scandalous cases that have been thrown up in the course of uh, uh, the last... 10, 15 years, and have put in place procedures to ensure that, and I hope this applies to all political parties, it certainly applies to my party, that anybody who has a possession of any information whatsoever in relation to the abuse of children has a duty and a responsibility to bring that forward to the police service. Similarly, in relation to the issue of bodies that have not been returned to loved ones, Anybody with any scrap of information whatsoever, I would wholeheartedly uh, and earnestly appeal to all of them, if they're out there, to listen very carefully, not so much to what I have to say about it, but certainly to the families who very eloquently and very passionately have argued the case for information to be brought forward. People are out there with that information. They have a duty to bring that information forward to alleviate the nightmare that these families are going through. I call Mervyn's story. Does the Deputy First Minister then, uh, following on from his logic when he called for the Cardinal to resign, uh, given the allegations in relation to uh, child abuse within the Roman Catholic Church, uh, does he now believe that it is time for his party president to resign and to ensure that there is transparency and there is openness and consistency in regards to the approach of what is a heinous and an evil crime, and that is abuse of children? Can, can I remind members that we're questioning the Deputy First Minister in his role as Deputy First Minister? I'll put it over to you if you wish to respond. Yeah, I'm prepared to answer the question. Uh, I don't believe that there's any similarity whatsoever between the case of the Cardinal and Gerry Adams. Uh, in the case of the Cardinal, a, a child was sworn to secrecy. In Gerry Adams' case, Gerry Adams was fully in support of his niece, travelled to Bunkrana, confronted his brother, and supported his niece and her mother when she reported the abuse to the social services and to the RUC. I think the other thing that's missed in all of it is that, you know, you can clearly see that sometimes in situations like this, people like to take political advantage without recognising 
for example, the trauma that the Jerry Adams' family went through as a result of the abuse uh, that was inflicted on them by their father. And in many ways, that entire family are victims, including Jerry Adams. And I think people need to understand that, and they need to place themselves, place themselves in that situation where quite clearly something was happening within that family which was terribly, terribly wrong. So I think that the two situations in regard to the Cardinal and Jerry Adams are not the same. And that is the end of topical questions to the uh, Deputy First Minister. Um, we now move on to oral questions that have been listed for the Office of First Minister and Deputy First Minister, and I call Gordon Dunn. Question one, Mr Deputy Speaker. Our recent successes of the Executive's Brussels office in partnership with relevant departments include helping to secure from the EU $150 million for a fourth peace programme, avoiding EU infraction proceedings in relation to Strangford Lock, ensuring regulations provide the potential to fund our regional road infrastructure, and securing timely state aid decisions which safeguard jobs and investments. In addition, since moving to new premises in 2010, some 6,288 visitors have attended meetings, events, briefings and cultural activities in our offices. However, we believe that such success is only delivered through the local efforts of our office in Brussels, which helps us navigate the complexity of the EU institutions. It is a resource for government and civil society alike. The offices are eyes and ears in Brussels and supports all executive ministers in their European engagement. Success is about getting our way in Europe with decisions that favour us by our making the right arguments at the right time to the right people. The Office uses the Barroso Task Force to get priority access to influence commissioners and senior officials in Brussels. This has not only enabled a full understanding of our situation, but also triggered quick decisions on state aid when needed by our businesses. The task force also gives us leverage to get commissioners and com commission officials over here, and the Commission has recently chosen Belfast as a host site for the International Smart Specialisation Conference. The Brussels office projects a positive image of our region by featuring our achievements in the policy arena and the field of culture and arts. The office also provides an excellent business environment in which to work. So reputation is a key to successful influence in Brussels and the EU, and I think our standing there is very good, and uh, we are now firmly on the Brussels map, and uh, I think we do punch above our weight, and I consider that a huge success. I call Gordon Dunn. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. How do we encourage local businesses to link in with the Bureau in order to get maximum funding from Europe for to support such businesses? It is, I would recognise it is an excellent facility, having visited it last year with the ETI committee. I think it is well worthwhile. Well, I think since the, the visit that myself and the First Minister were involved in, where we met with uh, Commissioner Maura Gagan Quinn, uh, we have been able to appraise uh, businesses here in the north, and indeed our own departments, about the importance of ensuring that they are consistently engaging with uh, the European scene. Uh, I suppose Europe in the past uh, frightened a lot of people off because of the complexity of the institutions there. But I think we're breaking that down. And I think increasingly uh, we are seeing uh, our businesses collectively go to Brussels, and we're also seeing commissioners come here. For example, Murray Gagan Quinn came here and addressed the business community uh, in a way that I think simplified the procedure and demystified the approach to Brussels. So I think we've got to keep that going, and I think that we in government have a key role to play, as have our departments, who are all now very, very much engaged in uh, ensuring that we draw down uh, the best that we possibly can uh, for our own area. I call Bronwyn McGann. Can the Deputy First Minister give us an update on the development of the Peace 5 programme? Well, the, the multi-annual financial framework 2014-20 allocated €150 million Euro to a Peace uh, 4 programme. The British government's economic pact has allocated a further €50 million 
to the programme from the overall uh, European territorial cooperation budget. Officials are working with the special EU programmes body on preparation of a draft operational programme based on research and initial public consultation. Policy areas currently under consideration include young people, shared space and services and civic leadership. It's important also that this aligns with the new good relations strategy together building a united community and the additional 50 million is linked to an executive commitment to utilise it in support of the strategies United Youth Programme where appropriate. Prior to finalisation, the draft operational programme will be subject to full public consultation. A final approval of the executive, the Irish Government and the European Commission will of course uh, will be required. I call Fergal McKinney. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker and uh, the Deputy or, sorry, Mr Deputy Speaker and the Deputy First Minister. Uh, he may be aware that uh, an official recently advised the FMDFN committee uh, on executive ambition on funding drawdown uh, through Horizon 2020. Uh, given that the Dublin drawdown from the previous R&D fund FP7 was significantly and commensurately more than Northern Ireland's, uh, does he agree that our ambition is weak, low and needs challenged? Well, our Barossa Task Force desk officers and the Invest in a European Union Research and Development Executive based in the office of the Executive in Brussels are part of the recently established uh, Horizon 2020 Contact Point uh, Network. Uh, the first meeting of the Contact Point Network was held in June 2013 in Brussels and was attended by representatives from Directorate General Research and Development of the European Commission. The Contact Point Network provides practical support to potential Horizon 2020 uh, from, from the north, and this includes assisting with the facilitation of visits to Brussels, support with project applications, as well as establishing links with other international partners, and more generally helping uh, to bring the network a closer uh, relationship with key directorate, general research and development staff in Brussels. So I, I believe that the Executive Office uh, could uh, improve how it operates for the benefit of all of us here. And the issue that the member raised in relation to the drawdown from the Irish government as opposed to ourselves, that obviously does represent a huge challenge for us, uh, which I think all of our departments are up for. Uh, there have been a number of discussions at the executive about how people should become more proactively involved with Europe, uh, recognising the opportunities that can be presented, not least by Horizon 2020. Can I advise members that question number 10 has been withdrawn and requires written answer? And I now call Leslie Cree. Question 2, Deputy Speaker. Well, the Executive and the Government are continuing to make progress towards commitments made in the uh, Economic Pact. We have delivered a successful G8 branded investment conference with Tourism Ireland, developing a considerable PR campaign to build on the G8 legacy. Securing the right policy levers, and in particular the devolution of corporation tax powers, remains a priority for the Executive. Uh, we are continuing to advance the case for the devolution of corporation tax within the time frame set out in the pact. And we have confirmed that we will continue to benefit from the 100% assisted area status until at least 2017. We are currently undertaking analysis to help inform any decision on the establishment of enterprise zones, and officials have had discussions in relation to establishing enterprise zones, including engagement with England, uh, Scotland and Wales. The Joint Ministerial Task Force is examining whether tailored support is required for local banks and how support for local businesses can be maximised to improve access to finance. An access to finance implementation panel has been established as recommended in the Economic Advisory Group's review of access to finance for business here. The first meeting was held on the 3rd of October 2013, and work is underway to address barriers to access for tourists, such as visa recognition and processing, building on from the, the success of the visa waiver system. The Executive has agreed the asset management strategy, which includes recommendations to improve processes and deliver significant projects that will unlock value through more efficient and effective management of assets. And we have also made good progress with the Better Regulations Executive to progress a review of business red tape in the local economy. 
I call Leslie Cree for supplementary. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his full reply. Minister, the Economic Pact outlined a new way forward on enterprise zones, and you did refer to that. These zones would allow Northern Ireland businesses in designated areas to benefit from enhanced capital allowances. Can the Minister outline the nature of such a scheme and what work has been taken forward at this time? Well, the, the Government's Economic Pact set out a number of proposals in relation to the potential establishment of uh, enterprise zones here. Uh, the majority of initiatives available within enterprise zones in Great Britain are, with the exception of enhanced uh, capital allowances, already devolved policy areas, and the Executive has already taken steps to support businesses using these levers. Enhanced capital allowances are a potential new lever, but would be of benefit only to larger capital intensive projects. And so we're currently exploring uh, this aspect uh, as well as other aspects to see how we can uh, move this uh, project forward. <clears throat> I call Chris Little. Thank you, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I thank the Deputy First Minister for his answer. Can I ask the Deputy First Minister whether he has any concerns that delays in finding suitable sites for shared housing and shared education could jeopardise the £100 million additional borrowing powers that the Economic Pact allocated for this purpose? No, well, I am uh, qu quite satisfied that the work that has been taken forward by the respective ministers in relation to uh, this issue uh, in the context of building a united community is uh, moving forward satisfactorily uh, with a, a full ability to ensure that the funding that uh, will be made available uh, can be spent. And of course, people will know that uh, huge progress has been made even in the course of recent weeks with the Lissanelli project. And I know the Minister for uh, Education and the Minister for Social Development uh, understand the importance of uh, ensuring that their departments are in a position to provide the necessary projects uh, that can uh, ensure the success of the to Together Building a United Community uh, process. So I think that a lot of work has been done. Uh, I think that people are exercised to ensure that we uh, take best advantage, uh, not just in terms of shared housing, but in terms of shared education. And I think in the course of the next uh, number of weeks and months, uh, all will become much clearer. And I think when that happens, members here will be, I think, very satisfied that uh, both ministers uh, who have a responsibility for shared housing and education have come up with the projects uh, that uh, we think we need. <coughs> I call Patsy McGloan. I've got the last one call you. I guess we have the last free wire to come. Thanks very much, Mr. Uh, Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Deputy First Minister as well. Uh, could the Deputy Minister inform us, um, he referred earlier there to corporation tax, as to what the agreed projected figure of the cost of corporation tax is to, to the local economy? Well, first of all, I think it's important to say that we remain fully committed to taking responsibility for corporation tax as a single uh, measure with the greatest potential to stimulate growth in the local economy. Uh, we wrote to the Secretary of State on the 24th of September to emphasise the need to work towards taking a decision immediately after the Scottish referendum. We believe that the legislative process could not be completed in this Parliament if a decision was left until the 2014 autumn statement, and this has implications for the work programme. It's critically important that relevant executive ministers and our officials are fully involved in the ongoing work by Treasury and HMRC on design issues, given that we will have responsibility uh, for the tax. Our letter highlighted the importance of our officials being briefed on progress and agreeing a process and timetable to reach agreement on the outstanding issues. In terms of the cost of all of this, uh, many figures have been thrown around over the course of the last uh, couple of years. And I think all of us clearly understand that in the final analysis, uh, whenever we get the Scottish referendum out of the way and hopefully get a positive decision from David Cameron, we are then into a renegotiation around the cost. So I think at this stage it would be a mistake on my part to, in the course of my answer to the member, to outline a figure which conceivably could change as time moves on. Moving on, I call Jimmy Spratt. 
Thank you, <coughs> Deputy Speaker. Question three. Well, Mr. Deputy Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior Minister Jennifer McCann to answer this question. <coughs> Set out in the Together Building a United Community Strategy, four urban village regeneration projects will be created in targeted areas of deprivation. Our aim is that each urban village will be designated as a development zone and a local board created. The board will be tasked with coordinating and overseeing the planning and design of the urban village. The board will be given powers to enable large-scale urban village development in a coordinated manner with a strong focus on the needs of the local community. A design group has been set up to progress the high level development of the Urban Village programme. The design group will also produce indicative costs for the proposal. We are currently considering where best to situate the Urban Villages to achieve maximum benefit from the proposal and intend to make a further announcement on the detail of these in due course. In making the final decision on which areas should be chosen as an urban village, we will take, it into, we, sorry, we will take into account a range of fac factors, including community relations issues, antisocial behaviour, deprivation, limited commercial heart and services within that community, and the community appetite and the infrastructure for improvement in that area. I call Jimmy Spratt. Thank you. Uh, Deputy Speaker, uh, I would fully urge uh, the Department to consider the Sandy Road Donegal Pass areas uh, for potential inclusion. And could I ask the Minister, uh, would she confirm uh, that the schemes will be taken forward on a cross-departmental and cross-agency approach? Well, I mean, as I say, we, the, in terms of the urban villages, the potential sites have been examined, and there's no um, definitive answer I can give you today on where those, those um, uh, urban villages are going to be. But certainly, um, we're very, very keen to make sure that regeneration, um, particularly in areas of deprivation, and it will be, um, uh, we will be going out to um, consult, obviously, with the local community um, around that. And you would be aware that there are a lot of community plans already in place for um, different uh, areas. So that's what we'll be looking at. But we will certainly be looking to um, engage with all stakeholders in this exercise. I call Mike Nesbitt. Uh, Deputy Speaker, thank you. And I, I thank the, the, the junior minister. Um, as she says, the, the, the projects are to tackle deprivation and dereliction. Uh, so is the Social Investment Fund. The junior minister is saying we will have a board to advise on these uh, urban villages. Uh, can I ask her how that board will interla interact with the zonal advisory panel, uh, which has already been set up to distribute the £80 million of Social <laughs> Investment Fund money? Will there not be a, an, an inevitable tension between these two? How will she manage it? Well, the member will be aware that the best way to um, deliver anything in local communities is in a strategic fashion, and that means tying all those area plans that are in together. And certainly, um, you mentioned the Social Investment Fund, and really, um, in terms of the, uh, the way that, that the, the design groups are already working, um, looking that there's seven different design groups within the Together Building a United Community Strategy. And they've already been doing a lot of work, and they have been already networking with local um, communities, and they have already been networking with those boards that you're talking about that have been set up for the Social Investment Fund. So it's about working together, and it's not about having something up here and something around there. So that's the way um, we, are, we are going forward with this, and those conversations have already taken place. I call John Dallet. Uh, Mr Deputy Speaker, I welcome the uh, Junior Minister's uh, response. Uh, and I find urban regeneration programmes fascinating subjects. But can the Minister tell us what happens after the new trees have been put in and the new pavia stones and all that to ensure that there is a neutral environment where, in fact, real regeneration can take place and people feel confident to shop in those towns and villages where they feel inhibited because of flags and curb stones, irrespective of the colour of the flag or indeed the curb stones? Well, I think just to say to the member that, that the whole sort of background um, when we were bringing forward the Together Building a United Community was about creating that shared space as well, particularly where the urban villages are concerned. And I think that, that the reality is, again, this is going to be from coming from the community up as opposed to um, up, from up down, if you like. 
and this is part of a consultation and we'll be tied in with all those um, other sort of groups and organisations that have already done a lot of work in, in some of the areas already around these issues and particularly the local councils in terms of going forward with community planning because none of these strategies can sit outside each other or in isolation, they all have to be tied in. So we would certainly um, you know, be going and we would be looking at the advice of the people that we would see as being the experts in that field and they're the people who live in those communities and who work in those communities and who have these plans already there. Um, um, so we're, we're, we'll be consulting with them and certainly it will be about creating that shared environment and that neutral environment so everyone can feel safe and, and, and feel comfortable when they're in that. I call Chris Hazard. Chairman Cahar, let a hold. Question four, please. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, sorry. Uh, this is Deputy Speaker, with your permission. Uh, <laughs> That many files here. Um, the Executive's Play and Leisure Policy Statement published in 2009 has been delivered through the Play and Leisure Implementation Plan which runs until 2016. Delivery against the plan is progressing well to further support the implementation plan and build on its achievements. We announced on the 8th of October our agreement to invest up to £1.6 million over three years to enhance opportunities for play and leisure here. And this will be provided as a signature programme through the Delivering Social Change Framework, as local communities are best placed to identify their own needs. Working closely with and supporting local communities will be a critical part of the success of this programme. This Play and Leisure Signature programme is intended to deliver three key outcomes. Promoting play to ensure that everyone is aware of the value and benefit of play, greater local access to space for play, and making planning and support for play central to the thinking and work of all our local councils. Our department is currently working with other departments to finalise arrangements for the delivery of this signature programme and we expect to announce details shortly. This demonstrates how we remain committed to supporting the Executive's commitment in the policy statement to deliver on children and young people's play and leisure needs and their right to engage in these activities. I call Chris Hazard. Gormogat, last can call you a session there. And can I thank the, the Minister for the, the detailed response and the, the news of the investment is certainly welcomed. Uh, I'm not sure if it will be possible, but could the Minister outline a timeline of when this project will be delivered? Gormogat. Well, obviously, like I said, communities will be critical in terms of the delivering of this programme, um, which is why we are very, very keen to ensure that the community and voluntary sector will be able to avail of the funding um, right away off these initiatives. Um, and I really think that, that working in partnership again with other departments such as DECAL, DOE and Health, um, we need to be working together, but we also need to be working with the local councils because there has been quite a lot of work already done within um, particularly some of the local councils who have already set up those uh, play partnerships. So I think that, that really um, once that is achieved, um, we would like to see the money hitting the ground as soon as possible. I call Karen McEvitt. Uh, thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. Can I thank the Minister for her response? But can I ask the Minister if any research has been carried out uh, to the access uh, to assess whether the implementation of uh, parking charges across the region has made it uh, more difficult for parents and children to access the, an example of uh, local play parks. Well, again, I mean we have we have been looking at funding, particularly in the local councils of taking forward of mapping out what is available and certainly that would be part of that um, process of mapping out parking um, availability as well because you're 100% right I mean you know if, if there's no access to play um, we're very very keen because play is a key area where um, the development of a child um, goes right into their adult, adulthood if you like and I think that it's very very important that we do map out the, the existing sort of amenities that are already there but certainly um, to try and look at the, the like of having access to it and that's where the funding particularly the funding that we will be directing towards councils will come in in terms of the planning and everything else around that. Moving on I call Mervyn Story. Question number five please. Uh, Mr. Speaker, with your permission, I will ask Junior uh, Minister McKenna to answer this question. Just getting a hard time today. Work on the implementation of the six delivering social change signature programmes 
which were announced by the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister on the 10th of October 2012 was progressing well. The Department of Education is leading on the signature programme to improve literacy and numeracy levels in both primary and post-primary schools. This programme will see approximately an additional 233 recently graduated teachers who are not currently in work being recruited to deliver tuition to children in a total of 267 primary and post-primary schools to assist them in achieving higher grades. It is proposed that 82 of those posts will be filled in primary schools with the remaining 151 posts being based in post-primary schools. Recruitment began in June of this year and is and as of the 25th of October, 188 of the posts have been filled, and of these, 67 are in primary schools and 121 are in post-primary schools, and these posts will run for two academic years, ending in August 2015. I call Mervyn Storey. Thank you, Mr Deputy Speaker. I thank the Minister for her reply. But given the concerns that have been raised in relation to the 70 posts that still weren't filled, uh, and the fact that we have now progressed well into uh, the first term, in fact now the second term of the schools back uh, for business, will the Minister give a guarantee or an undertaking that those schools that have missed out in terms of the full time available to them, given that this project is due to end in August 2015, will actually now be given an extension so that the benefits of the, the, the programme can be ensured and there can be tangible outcomes for the pupils for which it was originally intended? I mean, certainly, I mean, I, I can give the, the Minister, um, or, or sorry, the, the member, um, an assurance that we are keen to get these programmes and these teachers into the schools as quickly as possible. And I think just given the figures that I've just quoted, I think it's, it, we've done quite well in terms of, and not, not us, sorry, the Education Minister has done very well. Um, we also have a, a number of other uh, signature projects in terms of you know, the, the health of responsibility for and other departments have responsibility for who haven't done just as well as perhaps the educational one. So we're very, very keen to make sure that the family support hubs um, and the, also the social economy hubs um, that other ministers have responsibility for too um, uh, are, are brought forward. So we'd be monitoring it and trying to do our best to get that achieved. I call Pat Sheehan. I got a last concord, I got scum break a selection arrow, sub the fragra. Uh, I'd like to thank the minister for her answers. And I wonder if she could tell us if any additional measures are being proposed to improve literacy and numeracy. Or Margaret. Yes, again, um, just to tell the member, I mean, we're, we're hoping that when we are putting in signature programmes from Delivering Social Change, that they're not seen in isolation, that other departments are taking um, programmes together are forward, sorry, as well. And I'm pleased to say that in June of this year, the Education Minister agreed to fund an expansion of the Delivering Social Change project to support literacy and numeracy um, with a further injection of over £2 million from his department also. Um, and this will support uh, actually uh, another 21 newly qualified teachers in 33 schools. So this again has to be a welcome investment um, as it represents uh, supporting the literacy and numeracy, but it also um, demonstrates, which is a very, very important thing, that really that we, we, we don't want to be seeing the delivering social change uh, signature projects in isolation, that we want ministers and we want other departments to come forward with their proposals as well, which will tie, tie in with the, the overall, um, if you like, objective of delivering social change, which is to change um, the quality of lives of people in our communities. I call Danny Kinnahan. Deputy Speaker, may I thank the Minister for her, her answers. Um, but will there be targets and timelines um, put in place, and how will we judge? Will it be a zero game to make sure that everybody is literate and numerate at the end of this? Well, I think that, that it's very, very important that we do. I mean, um, we have seen um, a lot of, uh, if you like, uh, research has been done in terms of um, children and uh, the gap, if you like, between children who have achieved at school and children who don't. And I mean, it's, it's proven time and time again that if you're from a poorer family, 
um, that, that you have half the chance of the children maybe from more affluent families. Um, I think it's 34% to, um, compared to 68%. And really, international experience has shown us that resources need to be directed into those uh, families who are disadvantaged and from poorer backgrounds, or for, from children from poorer backgrounds. So I think that, that we're very, very keen to make sure. And the other, the other part of that um, also, um, to, to, just, uh, to just tell the member, is that not only does it enhance the achievement levels of the children from the poorer families, it also raises the bar for all children. Um, so we're very, very keen um, to see that happening. And in terms of, that's why we're targeting the need where, where the need needs to go. And particularly, and I know the Education Minister has done this, um, he has looked at it in terms of, of targeting those resources where they need to go. And that is the end of questions to the Office of the First Minister.